It is great to get to be here with y'all, and especially with this speaker lineup, a, a, an all-star cast of intellectuals, if there ever were one. Uh, I'm just a poor kid from Arkansas, so I'm gonna break that mold, and uh, that's, that's probably gonna be the most pathetic part of the, the lineup. But nevertheless, I assure you, uh, if nothing else, uh, I, will, I will be a needed break, and uh, you will enjoy that, I hope. I am nothing if not practical. I am very, very grateful for the quality of the presentations you are receiving throughout this event and that Michael is always bringing us uh, online and elsewhere. Um, I am concerned about pretty much one thing, crushing Marxists. And there's a reason. Marxism has already failed. Marxism has already shown itself to be the engine of enslaving half the planet and working diligently to enslave the other half. Marxism already murdered 100 million people in the prior century. I'm not sure why we would wish to give it a foothold to do so in the current one. Marxism is wicked in every particular. There is nothing in Marxism that is good, no matter what lies it tells you to try to cause you to believe it to be on the right side of history and on the moral high ground. It is a lie. It is a false gospel. It is in every particular wrong and corrupt and wicked and we must stand against it in this time as in all times before and in the times to come because if we learn anything from the book of Judges, it is that we will surely have to fight this battle again in the next generation and the next if the Lord does not come sooner. So we might as well learn these lessons now because we are going to have to teach them and reteach them until the day of our death and we may hope with great prayerfulness that our children are able to teach them to their children as well, or we will see a repetition of the horror show that is Cuba, that is North Korea, that is China, that is Venezuela, that was Poland, that was Hungary, that was Cambodia, when Paul Pot murdered a third of the population of his country in just two and one half years so morally outrageous that the communist Vietnamese had to invade that country to overthrow the communist regime that was murdering everyone. Socialism, Marxism, communism, fascism, all one thing. Sometimes different in method, sometimes different in terminology. We see a terminological shift certainly in the Frankfurt School Marxism that we see in our new Great Awakening, but it's all the same thing. It's the same playbook year after year after year, whether we are talking about the subversion of the mainline denominations 100 years ago, the overthrow of the democratically elected government of Czechoslovakia in 1948, the uh, rise of Danny Ortega to the top of the popular front in Nicaragua in 79, whether we are talking about the Bolshevik Revolution, Bolshevik being a Russian word that means majority. The Bolshevik party had about 3,000 members in all of Russia on the day it overthrew the Kerensky government in October of 1917. Majority, does this sound like the terminology we hear today? It is Orwellian, it is deceitful to its core. And we see the same plays run year after year after year after year after year in every context, in every nation, in every institution. It is the same, it is the same, it is the same, it is the same, it is the same. And it has the same end, the same end. It's worth remembering that Karl Marx was not writing in a vacuum. Marx was writing in the context of the revolutions of 1848. In 1848, Europe was engulfed in a wave of liberal revolutions. Now we are Americans and so we think in an American context and we are always prisoners of our own time. 
And in our own time, we hear liberal and we think Joe Biden or we think Kamala Harris or we think, uh, we think uh, maybe Walter Mondale, if we're old enough to remember. That's not what liberal means. And as you know, if you have read any Hayek, at one point, Mike uh, had my uh, topic as the road to serfdom. So, you know, a good F.A. Hayek reference. Uh, then he changed it on me in mid-course. Now I think I'm talking about uh, the, the harm that can be caused to the church by syncretistic Keynesian socialism. I looked at that and I said, I'm from Arkansas. I don't know if I can pronounce that. But we'll get there. In any case, if you have read your Hayek, if you have more than passing familiarity with the history of political thought, you're familiar with the fact that liberal actually means the values of the American Revolution. The things that in America we call conservatism are actually historically called liberalism. And the reason that we call uh, something else liberalism in America is because progressivism, which had become quite popular around the turn of the 20th century, became quite unpopular once it was in power. It became so unpopular that Democrats who had previously called themselves progressives started saying, oh, no, 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 I'm a liberal, which of course meant you. That happened in the 20s. It was a rebranding. You might notice that the other team rebrands quite a lot. You remember Bill Clinton? The era of big government is over. Remember that? We're not like Mondale and Dukakis. No, we're new Democrats. Don't think that's unique to the United States. You may recall that Tony Blair took a page out of Clinton's book in 1997 and ran as New Labor in 1997, and it, it uh, sold pretty well. They were still what they were. They were just hiding it better because every now and then the left has to rebrand because Lenin taught them we're going to take three steps forward and two steps back, and that's how we're going to advance the cause, right? Okay, so... A hundred years ago, the left said, no, 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 we're you. Just like the blue dog Democrats pretended to be you, they're conservative Democrats. Of course, they're conservative Democrats for baby murder. They're conservative Democrats for an ever-growing government that controls every jot and tittle of your life. They are actually the same old Democrats, you know, meet the new boss, same as the old boss. It doesn't really matter. Because, because, hey, we've got a new brand. That's how liberal came to mean what it means in America today. But in 1848, liberal very much meant what Thomas Jefferson and George Washington meant by it. And liberal revolutions swept the continent. And they were in immediate danger, although they didn't necessarily accomplish all that much, but they briefly looked like they were going to topple the, the European concept of conservative order, which was monarchism and aristocracy. And in that moment, Karl Marx says to his buddy, Frederick Engels, by the way, did you notice that Engels once said when asked, who do you hate most in all the world? What do you hate most in all the world? Engels responded with one word, Spurgeon. Mark says to his buddy Engels, this is a paraphrase, I wasn't present. You know what? We could co-op this. All these guys want freedom. Let's tell them we're giving them freedom. They all want a representative government. Let's tell them we're giving them a representative government. And we can ride that puppy all the way to setting up a completely new aristocracy and monarchy and we're the aristocrats and the monarchs. And isn't that exactly what socialism has been doing ever since? For 170 years, that's what we've been watching. 
Oh, they don't have dukes and earls in communist China. They don't have an emperor anymore. Russia no longer had a czar, no longer had, had any of those hereditary noblemen. And yet, didn't they? Were not their commissars every bit as powerful as any duke had ever been? But we tricked the people into trading out one set of established nobility for a new set of established nobility. Heck, in, in Cuba and North Korea, we don't even bother to hide what it is. It's a hereditary monarchy, isn't it? The House of Kim is alive and well in North Korea. They don't even hide it. The Castros rule as, as much as, as Ferdinand and Isabella and their heirs did. They're not even hiding. They came up with a plan that would hoodwink you into doing something that up to that moment had not been a popular idea in Europe, which was overthrowing an established nobility that had the legitimacy of hereditary and, and ancient utility and replacing it with themselves. Now, once you understand that it's all a scam, this gets a lot easier. Fast forward, they need a new rebranding. Just as the Democrats needed to stop being progressives because progressive was a surefire way to get you nuked at the ballot box, as uh, Mr. Harding and Mr. Coolidge and Mr. Hoover uh, were able to demonstrate pretty conclusively until Hoover round two, and then the new liberal Franklin Roosevelt was quite successful in nuking the now established to be progressive Mr. Hoover. Liberalism was a really good rebranding for these folks until about the 80s when Ronald Reagan was successful in pointing out what it really was. And then they needed a new rebranding again. And you saw James Carville actually originated the reintroduction of the term progressive, which everybody had forgotten they hated. And, uh, and now we, we have other rebrandings because, in fact, uh, the AOC crowd is, I guess, too young and stupid to realize that, in fact, socialism is probably not the brand they want to be bandying about. But the serious socialists understood this, starting with Gramsci, that socialism was never going to sell well in the United States. Why? Well, let me ask you, how many people here know somebody, even today in the 21st century, who is the first person in their family to go to college. I know a bunch of them. My mother actually grew up uh, not that long ago in a time where a short part of her uh, childhood was spent without indoor plumbing. Can you believe that? It has not been long since John Maynard Keynes and, and uh, his acolytes were, were quite convinced that post-World War II, there would be a new depression because families would actually have their own home and they'd have a car, note that's one car, and they would be so rich from that that in fact they would just stop working. That's as stupid as the rest of Keynesianism, actually. But you see how far we've come. In 1972, the average American lived in half the square footage that the average American lives in today. Oh, we're so much poorer. Oh, wages are stagnant. Are they really? Because we absorbed half the population into the workforce and didn't have a depression and wages didn't drop in half, that's a lot of economic growth. And by the way, a lot of what we have now, we do a lot cheaper. Have you seen one of these? What all does this do that you couldn't do 20 years ago? Or what all does this do that does 15 or 20 things that you did do more expensively? I mean, just the camera alone is a marvel. And I can actually video this whole thing. I could take a movie of Mike O'Fallon up here taking a movie of this event <laughs> and broadcast it for free. Yeah, we live pretty well. 
we uh, don't feel like there's a lot of danger that we are going to end up in serfdom, permanently toiling for a master we cannot overthrow, forever locked into a job we did not choose, along with our children and our children's children forever. We are not feudal. And so when, when Marx and all of those liberal revolutionaries of his time are selling to Europeans the overthrow of a hereditary aristocracy, nobility, monarchy, all of this, he is selling to a group of people who see no way out except to get on a boat and come to America. The problem is that means it's a little bit hard to sell to the people in America that there's no way out because they are in, from their point of view, the promised land. You can come here and you can be anything. You can do anything. You, if, if you don't like the town you're in, go start a town. If you don't like the job you're in, go create a job. Oh, you're black and that isn't working for you in 1848? Well, wait a couple decades and we're going to fight a war and you'll be free too. Say, well, not as free as you ought to be. I agree. I ain't complaining. I'm the son of, you know, former white sharecroppers. We weren't a lot higher on the totem pole. You think those Southern planter Democrats had a lot of favor in mind for a bunch of poor white Southerners either? We're just cannon fodder for them. They hate us all. If you're black or if you're poor white, it ain't no difference to the Democratic Party of Arkansas or Georgia or Florida or any of them. We are nothing but serfs, all of us. And it took a hundred years after the war to overthrow that. Because there's always a class of people, there is always, always, always a class of people who benefits from keeping all the other people down. There always is. And America was created for the opposite. America exists for the opposite. America is that place where anybody can go and become anything. Didn't guarantee it'd be handed to you on a silk pillow. It ain't easy. My dad worked his whole life. Worked his whole life. And never made in a, month, in a year what I make in a month. Or a week in some cases. I mean, we have some good years. I'll tell you what. And of course, I'm in startups, so we're bleeding money all the time. But isn't it cool that I get to bleed money? That's fun. I might be bankrupt next week, but we will have died trying. You know? You don't get to do that as a surf. And that ain't for everybody. Say, why are you using the word ain't, Rod Martin? Didn't you actually get any English in all that schooling? Well, yeah, I did, but I'm underlining the point. It's called punctuation. We, as a people, get to do something interesting. And that comes not from the revolution of 1848 or the many revolutions of 1848, but the revolution of, eight, of 1776. The one that said, we are, and this is what gets them, it's so Christian. We hold these truths to be self-evident. Don't even have to prove it. It's just obvious that all men are created equal. That includes the ladies. That includes people of what is called different races. I agree with, with the speaker just a minute ago that I don't see a biblical category of race. I don't know what that is. We're all descended from Noah, last I checked. I see a category of cousins, but I don't see a category of race. Seriously. And by the way, those cousins become brothers and sisters the minute you are reconciled to Jesus Christ because through Him alone is there any possibility of reconciliation. In Christ alone there is hope. In Christ there is adoption by the Father. We become co-heirs with Christ. That doesn't mean God's going to die. That means we're on the same standing with the Savior. The only begotten Son is the firstborn of many brothers and we get to be the adopted brothers and sisters. 
who cannot be plucked from his hand? Why would we mistreat anybody in that schema? Where is the room for there to be some privileged class or unprivileged class? We're all one. Says so plain as day right there in the Word. It says, says in Christ there is no Jew or Greek. There is no slave or free. We are all one in Him. That's, that's uh, Mike Stone said this at a preaching conference, Conservative Baptist Network through in Memphis a few weeks ago. He said, you know, the Bible is my analytical tool. Well, amen. That revolution said, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by government? No. By a document? No. Declaration, Constitution, no. Amendments, no. By their Creator, with certain unalienable rights, among which are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Life comes first because without life, none of the rest of it matters. Those 62 million infants that the Democrats have murdered since 1973, they don't get liberty or the pursuit of happiness. They don't get out of the womb. How many Mozarts, how many Da Vinci's, how many Einstein's, how many Musk's, how many just lovely young women that you wanted your son to date? Mothers of beautiful children that were never conceived? How many have died in that slaughter? Life, liberty, liberty. I saw some woke guy criticizing this conference on Twitter today, talking about, yeah, the Bible talks so much about individual liberty. Really? Because it is for freedom He has set us free. Indeed. And foremost among those, I might add, freedom to worship, which is why the Founding Fathers actually put freedom to worship first in that lovely list in the First Amendment. Right up front. Government can't tell you who to worship and can't tell you how and can't stop you from doing what you want. Why? Because what is more important than that? Now, they're happy for you to have the freedom to follow whatever ideology they tell you to. And they somehow mass, massively uh, pretend to ignore that from their point of view, a religion is an ideology too. It's a worldview. It's a way of seeing uh, what is and is not real. And what are the implications of that reality? They are not irreligious our opponents. They are absolutist. They intend to impose their state religion, their atheology. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And that one gets people. They don't know what it means. And they, you know, some of the ones who kind of think they know what it means, uh, think of it in terms of, of a Jeffersonian rhetorical flourish. Just, you know, he, he meant property, you understand. And that's fair because they, they kick that around in Philadelphia. Property, because that's the Lockean formulation. But, oh, wait, no. Pursuit of happiness. It is a rhetorical flourish, but it means something particular. Property is not the only way that you might pursue happiness. I have a daughter who likes to paint watercolors. Fortunately, she works for me, so she makes a pretty good living. But if she went and painted watercolors all the time, maybe she becomes rich like, you know, some of these guys do, but probably she's going on rod fair. I mean, that's just reality. It's not because she's not good, but have, have you seen the number of paintings there are in the world? I mean, seriously. <laughs> Supply and demand here. I told you I was the practical one. So, so, you know, if she is fulfilled by painting more than she is by working for the old fat man, 
uh, maybe she should go do that. I hope she thinks better of that idea. And I hope I didn't just put it in her head. But I'll tell you what, you ought to have freedom to do that if you want to. Government ought not be able to tell you that you should or should not do that. Some people find great fulfillment in being school teachers. Last I checked, they don't make a lot of money. Last I checked, a lot of them shouldn't, but that's another story. <laughs> Some people find fulfillment by being ball players. Very few of them ever make money at it. Some people find fulfillment by being engineers. I would not find fulfillment in that, although I would find fulfillment in employing a few. Some people are, are fulfilled in all manner of different ways, and we have a term for that in Scripture. It's called the body of Christ. It is the Lord who gave us the concept of the division of labor. And it took until the 18th century for somebody to actually figure out how to apply what the Lord had already said in the first century. And when they did, Adam Ferguson, Adam Smith, the philosophs, all these cool guys, some cooler than others, and they figured it out. And all of a sudden, the division of labor created the most phenomenal unleashing of wealth in the history of the world. That is the revolution of 1776 more than anything else. The unleashing of liberty that allowed prosperity. Or to put that a little more theologically, a massive pushing back of the curse. Because what we routinely forget and what our opponents have never learned is that wealth is not the accumulation of stuff. Wealth is the abolishing of want. When you get to heaven, you will not have any needs for which you lack. It's not going to be about having a big bank account in the first national bank of heaven. It's going to be about not having anything left that you could possibly want or need. Because it's all there, which is exactly the condition in the garden. And exactly the condition that is described in the new Jerusalem descending from the sky. All want will be abolished as it was in the beginning. There is only want because of the curse. The curse is the result of sin. It is only sin that results in poverty or death or any of the things that we face that are less than perfect. And yes, there is a creation mandate that says plainly that we are to take that template which was the garden and make the world like this. And we are. Even those who don't believe are. Not all of them. But if a Japanese company figures out how to make a screen that makes this iPhone possible, or a Korean company, or a Chinese company figures out how to manufacture it, they don't have to be Christians to be pushing back the curse. If a complete pagan comes up with a drug that cures COVID, they don't have to be a believer to be pushing back the curse. If an unbelieving scientist figures out a way, and by the way, they did. In the last half century, they did. Figure out a way to feed billions more people while taking a land area the size of India out of agricultural production. You want to talk about pushing back the curse? Eliminating famine is pushing back an awful lot of curse. I'll tell you what else. In the last 20 years, we've seen a billion people lifted out of extreme poverty. You say, well, what's extreme poverty? Is that a rhetorical device? No, actually, that is a, that is a statistical category. That is people who live on $1 a day or less. A billion people have been lifted out of extreme poverty in the 20 years, roughly following the fall of the Soviet Union. Socialism. And a billion more will be in the 20 years to come. We're on track. It's happening. We're going to see the elimination of the entire category of extreme poverty in our lifetime. You tell me that we are living in a bad time? No, we're only living in a bad time to the degree that we allow sin to mess it up. That revolution in 1776 established life 
liberty and, oh wait, the pursuit of happiness, which is to say the right for you to pursue the gifting God gave you individually, not the assigned task of a central planning bureau. That is remarkable. And if you think that Marx is the first one to come up with a central planning bureau, you are sorely mistaken and need to read a little more history. That revolution is hated. If anybody here has had a uh, senior level political science seminar in the last quarter century, you know how hated it is. They will tell you that the American Revolution wasn't even a revolution at all. The American Revolution was just a colonial uh, uh, war. It was just, it was just uh, one elite fighting another elite. Funny how the left always projects. The American Revolution is the only real revolution in the history of the world. Now then you have people on the other side of the dispute in the church go on about how, how it was evil and it violated Romans 13 and blah, 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 and that just demonstrates that they probably have never heard of Rutherford. They probably can't pronounce Lex Rex, don't understand that it is the duty of the lesser magistrate to act on behalf of the people in their charge against a tyrannical greater magistrate who in fact is breaking covenant with them, which is exactly the situation that existed in 1776 when the king was acting tyrannically toward his proper subjects in the American colonies. The American colonies rightfully had parliaments of their own and were being dictated to by the Westminster Parliament uh, in which they had no representation whatsoever. You may recall, no taxation without representation. That is just one aspect of the problem. And so after much, much discussion and many, many uh, efforts to try to reconcile with the king, they actually did what was good and right and stood up for the people in their care. That is what the lesser magistrates are supposed to do. So I reject the Christian anti-American argument as thoroughly as I reject the Marxian anti-American argument, and I hold the American experiment up as indeed one of the foremost expressions of Christian thought in the history of the world. You say, well, it wasn't perfect. We didn't immediately get slavery abolished. Well, that's true, we didn't. We didn't immediately do a lot of things. Do you know that in 1776, there were about three million of us total from, from Maine to Georgia? Three million. And they didn't have these interwebs either. There were a lot of things they didn't know and they were doing pretty good for their time. If any of you can go come up with the American Constitution Bill of Rights, I encourage you to do so. Let's see you do that independently, you and 54 of your friends. I think those boys done good. I am grateful to be their heir and you all with me. They were not perfect, nor did they birth a perfect society, but I'm not troubled by that because I know there will be no perfect society upon the earth until the Lord himself returns as he surely will someday. Amen. Amen. Marx hated that revolution because that revolution encouraged people to feel no need for his scam. And it disturbed socialists and communists for decades trying to figure out why the revolution did not come in Britain and America in the way that they predicted that it would. When the revolution did come, it came in agrarian societies that had not reached the level of economic development that was predicted. It came in places like Russia. It came in places like China. Uh, if you can call that a true revolution. And, and it, came in, it came in all of these societies where, where uh, power literally came from the barrel of a gun. And so, so they were perplexed by this. And a certain Mr. Gramsci uh, properly deduced the problem, I think, and his heirs in what we call the Frankfurt School uh, figured it out pretty well. They figured out in, in appropriately academic sounding language, of course, that the scam wasn't well tailored to us because you think you're going to be better off in a year than you are today. Y'all do. Anybody here think you're going to be poorer in 10 years? I mean, seriously, this is America, right? Anybody here think your kids are going to be worse off 
I mean, you can always find some liberal hiding behind a mask in a corner, and they're, they're sure of it. But, nah, not this room. So, so, sure enough, the Frankfurt School came up with a new marketing plan. You might think it's academic, and all these guys up here on the podium who are way smarter than me will tell you all the academic stuff about it. I'm going to tell you the deal. The deal is they needed a better hustle. That's the truth. So here's the hustle. We can't get these Americans to think in a million years that they're getting poorer or that anybody's holding them down. Everybody in America does better with time. If they work hard and they hustle and they get out here and get it done, there's a way forward. They'll struggle and they'll have people who don't like them, but they'll overcome it. My goodness, if they excel, they'll stand before kings. Those Americans do it all the time. We got to come up with something new. So here's what they came up with. They said, you know, we can get 20-year-old gender studies majors to believe that they should be ashamed of daddy's money, but that wears off by the time they're 30 because they get a W-2 and they realize that all their money's being taken from them. So that isn't a good plan. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to convince them that they should feel guilty. Existentially. Their mere status as something they cannot control makes them an oppressor. Oh, and for good measure, the 20-year-old the gender studies major sitting beside her who's black or brown or whatever she may be, we're going to convince her to be angry at the first one. And not just a little angry, but permanently angry. Angry about every past sin committed by every generation going back as far as it's convenient for us to lie to her about. Because if you carry that out, you know, to its logical conclusion, well... I owe reparations to the Anglo-Saxons because I have a great, great, however many great grandfather who came over with William the Conqueror from Normandy. And so we oppressed the Angles and the Saxons and the Jutes pretty bad. We totally did. We killed Harold. We did it. We are guilty. <laughs> and, and actually that guy has ancestors, goes all, back, all the way back to Rome and Italy. Well, the Romans overran the Britons. Well, I'm going to owe more reparations. I've got to find some Britons to pay. And, and probably some others. I bet I owe the Gauls. I'm sure of it. <laughs> There's no end to it. And then it gets even weirder because I've got some Choctaw in me. So I owe me some reparations for the Trail of Tears. I don't know where it ends. Although I really shouldn't because I'm a Republican and it was the Democrats did the Trail of Tears. It was the Democrats did slavery. It was the Democrats did the Civil War. It was the Democrats did Jim Crow. It's the Democrats doing this. Do you see a pattern? Yep. That's right. yes. And I'd go you one further. I'm actually a member of the, of, you know, one of two political parties in this country. You know, we got a left one and a right one. I'm actually a member of the political party in this country that never had its own terror wing. Did you ever think about that? My party never had the KKK. My party never had Antifa. My party actually thought you ought to win at the ballot box. There were 4,000 people lynched in this country during the Jim Crow years, and I got news for you, every last one of them was a Republican. 3,000 black people and 1,000 white people got lynched in the Jim Crow era, and they were all Republicans until the 30s. There weren't that many lynchings after the 30s, so I guess a few Democrats might have gotten in then. Not many. You know, from where I'm sitting, both the, both the English-American part of me and the Irish-American part of me, and by the way, the English part owes reparations to the Irish part, and, uh, and the Choctaw part of me, 
And my wife is Irish and English and, and Cherokee, so they all owe each other. And, you know, there's just no end to it. But it seems to me that based on political party, I kind of think I have clean hands. We fought that tyranny all the way back to the founding of our faction. We've been against all that from the beginning. So if we're going to hold people accountable for what their great, 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 great grandfather did, maybe we should hold our team to the same standard. No, we fought you in and we're fighting you now. We stood against your racial oppression then, we're going to stand against it now. We stood against your divide in the country and taking us to literal war then, and we're going to stand against it now. We stood against it when you burned the cities in 68, and we're going to stand against it now. No, it isn't our fault. First of all, I wasn't born for any of that. But it doesn't matter because wokeness. No, I, I, I'm, I'm, not even, I'm not even accountable for it by your own standards. My people didn't do that. I'm a poor kid from Arkansas. We were part of the oppressed. Those white planter Democrats hated us just as much. Why do you think there was a Jim Crow in the first place? They saw the populist movement sweeping the Midwest, and they knew that if the poor white sharecroppers got together with the poor black sharecroppers, they'd get kicked out of Little Rock and Montgomery and, and uh, all of the state capitals across the South. They knew the jig was up, and that's when they gave you segregation. Because they knew if they get those poor white farmers to think that those poor black farmers might come rape their daughter, they could get something stirred up that'd last for a hundred years, and it did. They are merchants of hate, enmity. They are deceivers, they are accusers, and they have been doing this game for a heck of a long time. Marx came up with the first iteration of the scam, then... Gramsci and his followers came up with the second, this, this woke thing. I just believe that you should not be part of a political movement that starts from bad grammar. <laughs> or from hate, endemic hate, horrific hate, unending hate irreconcilable hate. Because that's the real danger to the church. The real danger to the church is that this is a false gospel. This is evil in its core because what it says is we're going to define a group of people over here who can never repent. And we're going to define another group of people over here who never need to. And I got news for them all. They all need Jesus. All of them together. And in Jesus, there is reconciliation, there is repentance, there is redemption, there is forgiveness, there is liberty for all of them alike. They may all sit down together and remember that they are not estranged groups of people arbitrarily defined by the people who brought you stuff like craniology. They are not that. No, they are cousins in the flesh descended from Noah and Adam, and they are brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ if they will merely confess with their mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in their heart that God raised Him from the dead, they shall be saved together. All of them. All of them. All of them. And there is no distinction between them. They have different backgrounds. They have different gifts. They have different things they can bring to the table. Some of them can tell the others of them about things that happened to them that, that enrich the combined experience. Praise God, whoever it was in the Americas had tomatoes and took that to Italy. They call that cultural appropriation now. I call that Olive Garden. <laughs> Some of them can talk about what it was to march at Selma and the rest of us are made richer and better for it and more compassionate on our brothers. 
Some of them can talk about it, what it was like to be a mama. Maybe even miscarry. Maybe go through that pain. We can learn from that. We can be better for that. Some of us can talk about what it was to be there holding her hand. We can be better for that. Some of us have different experiences from one another, but all of that comes together in the mercy of Christ so that we are all enriched as one. E pluribus unum, out of many, one. Oh, they hate America for a lot of reasons. They hate America because they hate nation states. They don't want you to be able to rule yourself. And when they talk about nation states, why do they hate them? That's a good question. They want to talk about Hitler. They want to talk about national socialism. Funny, they always leave out the socialism part, but they sure enough leave in the nation part. They miss the part that the British were talking about that too and the French were talking about that too. That wasn't nationalism. That was imperialism. And they want to put you under an empire now. They want to put everybody in Europe under an empire run from Brussels by unelected bureaucrats. We used to call those aristocrats. That's what that is. They want to put you under unelected rulers in Washington. Some people call that the deep state. Some people call that a bureaucracy. That's an aristocracy. That's what it is. They want to put you back under the exact same system of government that existed before Karl Marx first wrote one word. Workers of the world unite. You have nothing to gain from these people but your chains. That's what they offer you in the name. In the name. In the name of freedom. In the name of liberation. In the name of the Father of lies. They hate America because of that, and they also hate America because it is, in its essence, not perfect, not flawless, not complete, not finished, but Christian. The expression of the ideas of Scripture into the form of a system of government and a way of living that has changed the world in every imaginable and positive way. They want to focus on the faults? I can focus on the faults of David, but God called him a man after my own heart. I can focus on the faults of Paul and he'd never get to be an apostle because we'd be talking about Stephen. I can talk about the faults of anyone and anything. God focuses on redemption. Have we lived up to all of the promise of the founding? No, we have not. Are we gonna? Well, if you'll covenant with me to do so, maybe we can. And if we don't quite get there in this generation, that's why we have children to raise them up to do better. And someday Jesus is gonna set it all right. But I guarantee you this, you won't get there by imbibing deeply of another devil's lie. One we have seen destroy half the world. One we have watched murder a hundred million people in the last century and it will do more again. We will not get there. We will not get there. We will never get there by making the same mistake Again, it doesn't matter how you repackage this lie. It's the same old lie. It's from the same old father of lies. It is the same disaster. And we can totally destroy ourselves with this and we can take the world down with us. If you think that America will collapse over this, you are sorely mistaken. America will be vastly wealthy, powerful, and evil. It will be an empire like the Soviet Union never dreamed of being. It will be an empire like Darth Vader never dreamed of having. It will enforce wickedness everywhere there is. It will impose darkness wherever there is light. You can't afford to let America go. And it's not just for you. And it's not just for your children. No, it's for the whole world. This 4% of the world's population will end up destroying the other 96. It will do it as sure as night follows day. And they will start with wiping out the, the reality. Just for starters, you may not know this, but American Christians give 5.5 times as much to foreign missions by themselves as the entire rest of the world does combined. Why did the, you think they want to tax your church? Why do you think they want to padlock your door, throw 
throw a John MacArthur in prison or bankrupt him with fines. Why do you think they want to do this? They want to stamp out the light of the gospel everywhere it goes because it is the one thing that stands in the way of their lie. Their scam dies at the foot of the cross. And why do you think that they want to infiltrate the church? Why do you think they want to lie to our leaders and, and take them down this primrose path? Most of them aren't there, I don't believe, because they have believed this lie and, and become part of the cabal or whatever. But many of them have been seduced by its promises and by the, the approbation of men. We need to pray for them. We need to help them to repent. We need to help them turn back to the Word and the Word only. The sufficiency of Scripture. In the Southern Baptist Convention, I'm going to say this real quick and then I'm going to hush about it, but we have started something called the Conservative Baptist Network. You may know that I'm, on the, uh, I'm an officer of the Executive Committee of the Southern Baptist Convention. My heart is very much there. I was a Baptist before I was a believer, as, as probably most Baptists were. And, and, uh, and I'll tell you what, we educate in our six seminaries, one-third of the seminary students in North America. You want to hand that over to the other team? We got the biggest missionary force in the history of evangelicaldom. You want to hand that over to the other team? Just at the national level, we got 30 billion some odd dollars in assets. You want to hand that over to, I don't know, Russell Moore? I don't. I might be a little more impressed with Russell if he had said one word in the last six months about what's being done to John MacArthur. Our Ethics and Book Review Commission is getting to be a bit of a thorn in my side. So we started the Conservative Baptist Network to rally the faithful. I'm here to tell you, I can prove it from, if nothing else, the election results in 2016, that most Baptists aren't where they are. The Baptist in the pew is still a very conservative person who actually thinks that a pro-life issue means not killing babies as opposed to providing cradle-to-grave welfare. And so, so uh, a lot of us actually think that maybe somebody ought to point that out. We'll see where that goes, but I encourage you to join conservativebaptistnetwork.com. And I encourage you, whatever denomination you're in, whatever community you're in, whatever town, city, state, village you are in, stand. This is the time. It's getting away. Stand now or wish you had. Stand now. It won't be a tomorrow if you don't. It's time, folks. It's time. This is an old, old lie. It is an old, old scam. It is dressed up in academic language, but it is nothing but a flim-flam con. And if you don't see that after today, you probably ain't gonna. So, so if your neighbor looks confused, shake them a little and tell them again. Because we have to stand today. I do not wish to stand before Jesus Christ and explain to Him why I did not deliver safely or die trying my Southern Baptist Convention to the next generation as it was handed to me, why I did not stand up and hand my country to the next generation as it was handed to me. And you better consider very carefully whether you want to be the person who stands before Jesus and it has to explain that. These are the times. You must stand. You must stand. You must stand now. And I believe with all my heart that if God can part the Red Sea and create the heavens and the earth, He can give us this victory. This isn't the first lie to come along. It's not even the first iteration of this lie to come along. We can beat it. We can stand triumphant. And we can deliver a decent and good and better tomorrow to those children and grandchildren. And they can look back and look at you and say, you know, I wish with all my heart I had gotten to live in the days that my father and my grandfather fought that fight. I wish with all my heart I had gotten to do the deeds that they did. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give them a legacy. This is our time. Don't stand on the sideline. Get in the war. We're going to win. Thank you. <laughs>